All right, everybody. Well, good afternoon. My name is Chris Curry, and I am an assistant professor at Iowa State University in the Department of Horticulture. I'd like to first start by thanking Fine Americas for their sponsorship today and supporting this webinar so you viewers could view it for free and, and uh, make it very accessible to people. Today I'm going to talk about some work that I've done here at Iowa State University uh, focused on controlling the growth of seed propagated New Guinea impatiens flats. So the challenge with bedding impatiens. I'm sure this is not coming as a big piece of news to many of you as we've all heard about it, but uh, impatiens downy mildew is now in the landscape. And what's happening with impatiens downy mildew is the incidences of where it's occurring is increasing geographically, so it's spreading a little bit. What happens is when impatiens, bedding impatiens, get infected by impatiens downy mildew is their landscape performance can decline. They can defoliate and ultimately result in death not very attractive at all, especially when we're looking at beds of annuals where we need a big splash of color. So what we have is both consumers and landscapers reducing the number of bedding impatiens that they're utilizing in their gardens. But with the loss of these bedding impatiens, what are the growers and retailers going to use to fill that empty bench space? So there's a couple things we need to think about. What annual could be grown in shade and still flower. And one of the best replacements was, or one of the best replacements is begonias. And we saw some good examples of wax begonias in Brian's previous presentations on the paclobutrazole in the water source. But wax begonias, people are already utilizing. We were looking for another alternative aside from just begonias. Here we have New Guinea impatiens. And these are seed propagated New Guinea impatiens. One of the benefits about seed propagated New Guinea impatiens is that impatiens hawkeri, the genus and species for New Guinea, seed New Guinea impatiens, is resistant to impatiens downy mildew. They are unaffected by this disease. So this means that these crops can grow in the shade and flower and still be unaffected by that impatiens downy mildew. And you see here some mature flowering seed propagated New Guinea impatiens. They look great. One of the challenges, though, is trying to get them in a flat. When these plants are planted in flats, New Guinea impatiens are generally a more robust growing plant. Okay? But the, the fact that we now have impatiens that can be propagated by seed, that lower cost propagule, gives us the opportunity to put these plants into packs and into a flat. And again, with the loss of bedding impatiens, we're not really opening up space in the four inch containers on our benches. We're opening up space for that flat production. And these seed propagated New Guinea impatiens are something that could be produced more economically in a flat, unlike impatiens that would be propagated by cutting. So putting these seed propagation New Guinea impatiens into flats is going to require some changes in production. Primarily, how are we going to control the growth of these plants? Again, New Guinea impatiens, seed or veg prop, are going to be uh, larger plants, just generally speaking. So we've got to control the growth, especially when we downsize into a flat. Now, work done, previous work actually that Dr. Whipker has done, has shown that you can affect the growth using the nutrition or our fertilizers. We can also restrict our irrigation and irrigate less to try and control the growth. But is that going to produce enough control to downsize plants for flats? I'm not sure. In fact, I'm a little skeptical about that. But chemical plant growth regulation, uh, I thought would be a great tool for controlling height. So the question is, what active ingredients and what concentrations can effectively control the growth of seed propagated New Guinea impatiens grown in flats. You see that abbreviation NGI? I'm going to use that throughout the presentation in text just to shorten it up a little bit, and it's for New Guinea impatiens. So we conducted a series of experiments, and as the title indicated, we were trying to screen a broad array of chemicals to see what works. So we started out with three seed New Guinea impatient cultivars, uh, Divine Cherry Red, Divine Scarlet Bronze Leaf, and Divine White Blush. These plugs were grown in 288 cell plug trays. Upon receiving the plug trays, we transplanted them individually into 1801 cell flats, in bedding plant flats. 
Plants were fertilized at every other irrigation event with 150 parts per million nitrogen. So you get a general idea of our greenhouse culture. Now, seven days after transplanting the plugs into our flats, they were treated with a number of different treatments. Okay, And so what I did here is I tried to include all of those common PGRs that are used to control the growth of crops. And that includes ansimidol, chloramiquant chloride, diminazide, ethafon, fluoroprimidol, paclobutrazol, and uniconazole. And then, of course, we included an untreated control. Those were treated with water. Now, for each of these chemicals, I used three concentrations for this initial experiment. We had a low, a moderate, and a high rate. And these rates come from just general rates or concentrations that we commonly see uh, in literature and trade publications and labels for recommendations. So for some chemicals, like uniconazole, we had from 5 to 10 parts per million. Uh, alternatively, for chemical like diminazide, we had from 1,250 parts per million to 5,000 parts per million. Again, we were trying to screen a range of concentrations. And in this first experiment, we collected data on the time to flower and the final height. Now, there's a lot of data that I could show you from this first experiment, but what I'm going to focus on is this one graph. And on this graph, we've got our height of the New Guinea impatiens from the substrate surface to the tip of the growing point. And then we've got on our x-axis the different treatments, control, ansimidol, chloramiquat, all the way to uniconazole. And for simplicity, I picked that moderate rate, that middle rate. So again, for ansimidol, that would have been 40 parts per million. For ethafon, 500 parts per million. For uniconazole, 10 parts per million. So we're just showing those moderate rates across here. Now when you look at the left side of the graph, you see our control plant. Now, when we look across those treatments, we were again trying to find which chemicals were effective. And actually, it segregated fairly clearly. This figure demonstrates clearly that fluoroprimidol, paclobutrazole, and uniconazole were the most effective chemicals for suppressing height of those New Guinea patients. Now, we wanted to get a little bit better understanding of the effect of the concentrations. And so we conducted a follow-up experiment. Now, some other data that I don't have to show you from this first experiment is the time to flower, because height is really the most important thing that we were concerned about. Now, the time to flower, we were observing delays in flowering when plants were treated with the high concentrations of ethafon. And this makes sense. Ethafon can abort flowers, so we were expecting that. But we did notice some flowering delay on the, on the high concentrations for some of these chemicals. Otherwise, the moderate and low rates did not affect flowering that much. So we wanted to get, again, a better understanding of the effect of these PGR concentrations. So we kept those same three cultivars. They were planted uh, in the same fashion and fertilized as in the first experiment. And the same data were collected on final height, just like in experiment one. Now, we selected fluoroprimidol, paclobutrazole, and uniconazole. But we expanded our concentrations. Again, we wanted to get a bit better understanding of what concentrations would be effective for use. Okay? So they were again treated seven days after transplanting. So let's take a look at what we saw. Here we have divine cherry red. And we've got fluoroprimidol and paclobutrazole that were treated with 0 to 40 parts per million and uniconazole that were treated with 0 to 20 parts per million. Now, I think this demonstrates the effect of concentration on height fairly clearly. One interesting thing is fluoroprimidol and paclobutrazole had similar responses with their concentrations. However, with uniconazole, you'll notice that concentrations that were half of those used for fluoroprimidol and paclobutrazole resulted in much more growth control. Uniconazole is a very potent PGR. And we saw results similar to this with our other cultivars. Here we have divine scarlet bronze leaf, and you can see again, fluoroprimidol, paclobutrazole, we have a nice curve, plants uh, that are shorter with increasing concentrations. But look at uniconazole. As we jump from 0 to 2.5, from a tree down to a ground cover nearly, we have a very drastic reduction or suppression in plant height. And the same story can be seen when we look at divine white blush. Now, let's take a look at all this data together on a graph. 
here we've got, again, our three cultivars, Divine Cherry Red in the top row, Divine Scarlet Bronze Leaf in the middle row, and Divine White Blush on that bottom row. And we've got Fleurprimidol as the first column, Paclobutrazol as the second column, and Uniconazole as that final column. And when we look at what we're targeting for a plant height, we found similar responses across our cultivars within a chemical. So generally speaking, 5 to 10 parts per million resulted in acceptable control when we used fluprimidol and paclobutrazol. However, for uniconazole, you could use that 2.5 part per million concentration. However, I would encourage exploring and using a slightly lower concentration. Those plants treated with 2.5 parts per million, they didn't look bad, but it might be a little bit excessive control. And we did not transplant those plants out into the garden and see what subsequent effects we had on growth. So what can we take home from this uh, study? Well, seed New Guinea impatiens are definitely a good option for a, an alternative to your bedding impatiens as a crop that can be produced in flats. Now, the recommended concentrations based on our results in our greenhouse, we find that somewhere between 5 or 10 parts per million of fluprimidol or paclobutrazol would result in adequate control in a nicely shaped plant. Now, as I said on the previous slide, uniconazole is highly effective, and I would encourage growers to try concentrations lower than 2.5 parts per million. Uh, maybe 1 to 2 would be another a good range of concentrations to try. Now, although these are recommendations that we're coming up with doing these systematic experiments, as always with PGRs, you're really encouraged to experiment with the concentrations and chemicals in your own greenhouse because our greenhouse environments and the culture and way we grow plants is going to vary from greenhouse to greenhouse. And we always want to make sure that you are getting the concentrations that work well for you in your situation. But again, 5 to 10 parts per million, fluprimidol and paclobutrazol are a good place to start. So with that, I think I've come to the end of my time, and I'd like to take if we have any time for some questions.